Good morning. Can you hear me? You can? Okay, good. Where did Rob just go? Come here, brother. I got it. A little coin. I don't want to see it on eBay. <laughs> Fetch a big price, these coins. Thank you, sir. Thanks, brother. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Well, listen, good morning, uh, everyone. I, uh, and in particular to, to Rob. Hey, Rob, I did a little research on you also. Uh, and I understand that. Okay, hold on. Isn't this supposed to be an engineering savvy institution? What's the matter with us here and here? That should work. That should work. Okay, how about now? Good, they've got two here. One so you can hear me, the other one so it can get recorded. You okay? <laughs> like a frisk. There you go. Okay, great. Oh, anyway, I was talking about Rob, and I, I gather that he uh, is going to find out very soon whether he has been selected for naval aviation. And I, of course, can't comment on or influence a decision of that kind, but I think he'll probably do, do just fine. Uh, I have to say that at Pod, I, I, at reading his bio, my senior military assistant, um, who is uh, Marine Brigadier General Eric Smith, fantastic guy, told me, sir, this man was born to be a Marine. So I'm gonna have to get in touch, you in touch, Rob, with Eric for a little personal counseling there. You can thank me later. Uh, Steve uh, Vossen, thank you for inviting me here today. And to you all, midshipmen, good morning. It's a good pleasure to be with you. As someone who's trained as a physicist, it's particularly uh, fun for me to be here in Hyman Rickover Hall, uh, because Admiral Rickover was one of my personal heroes, a man who invited me to discuss my own career with him when I was just about your age uh, and exchange too colorful and too profane to share with you uh, today, but maybe privately we can do it. Those of you who know Hyman Rickover will know or know of him, know what I mean. Uh, are you all getting class credit for this, for attending this thing this morning? No? No? Well, all right. Uh, I, uh, I, I can probably do something about that uh, I, right up until December 4th, because that's when I leave office. Uh, after serving nearly five years, uh, President Obama and first Secretary Gates, then Secretary Panetta, and uh, now Secretary Hagel, uh, first as Undersecretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, and now as Deputy Secretary of Defense, I'm going to be leaving the government on December 4th. So after saluting Secretary Hagel for one last time and handing off my duties to my successor, uh, I'm going to board a plane with my wife, Stephanie, and take a long-awaited vacation in New Zealand. That means that to watch the Army-Navy game, I'm going to have to find a bar in Auckland that's open at 9 a.m., <laughs> although uh, Secretary Mabus and Admiral Greener tell me I don't even need to watch because we all know how it's going to turn out. <laughs> Uh, on a more serious note, I am counting down the days to my departure because serving as Deputy Secretary of Defense has been the highest and is the highest honor and privilege in my life. And I say that because there is no higher calling and no jobs on this planet more uplifting and satisfying than serving our sailors, soldiers, airmen, and Marines as you will do. And also, by the way, our DOD civilians, contractors, everyone else who's part of our total force, as well as our veterans and our military family. No higher privilege than that. I first came to the Pentagon, believe it or not, in 1979. Uh, and I've returned in various capacities under 11 secretaries of defense because of that sense of purpose that I know you all feel too. 
Well, we may be at different points in our career, uh, but I think you probably already know what I'm describing. Each of you chose to came, come to Annapolis and stick through I Day and plebe year and the signing of your uh, two for seven and so forth, and you did that for a reason, maybe for several reasons. Maybe because you wanted to receive a superior education, which you do here. Maybe because you wanted to play a sport. Maybe because you wanted to surround yourself with high caliber instructors and shipmates. Those are all great reasons. But you also came and stayed, I'm sure, because you wanted to be part of something larger than yourselves. Because you wanted to protect this country, make a better world, and because you wanted to lead sailors and Marines. It was 50 years ago today that another personal hero of mine and so many other Americans, President John F. Kennedy, was assassinated. Two years before he was killed, President Kennedy spoke right here at the Naval Academy. And in a speech to the midshipmen of his time, he said, the answer to those who challenge us so severely in so many parts of the globe lies in our willingness to freely commit ourselves to the maintenance of our country and the things for which it stands. And that call to action and your response is why I wanted to come talk to you today before I leave. I wanted to give you, you know, you are our Navy and our Marine Corps future leaders. I want to give you my perspective on why what you've chosen to do matters, a sense of the security challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for us, and of what's going to be asked of you in the years to come. Let me start with a world you will enter when you earn your commission. When the firsties in this room arrived here in the fall of 2010, Al-Qaeda's senior leadership was still intact and Osama bin Laden was still alive. We still had roughly 50,000 service members on the ground in Iraq and had only recently completed the surge of forces in Afghanistan necessary to degrade the Taliban and to build the Afghan National Security Forces. NATO casualties were then, I remember this very vividly, at their highest levels since the toppling of the Taliban government and progress in Afghanistan was uncertain. So-called Arab Spring had yet to unfold. Syria was quiet, and the administration had not yet announced what would come later to be known as the rebalance to the Asia Pacific. And on the domestic front, meanwhile, the gusher of Defense spending, as former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates famously called it, hadn't yet been turned off. Today, less than four years later, our world is very different. Your world is very different. You and the class of 2014 will report to your first ship or take your first platoon in some of the most rapidly changing, momentous, and challenging times in recent history. Times comparable only to the emergence of the bipolar system following World War II or to the collapse of that system at the end of the Cold War. Since 9-11, and thus for most of your lives, and most of my most recent service, the Department of Defense has necessarily been preoccupied with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, the Iraq war in Iraq over, and in a little over a year, NATO's ISAF mission set to conclude and the Afghan government to assume full responsibilities for security within its borders. At that point, the United States' combat role in Afghanistan will cease and the post 9-11 era, as we've come to call it for the last 12 years, will also come to an end. And that's the future into which you'll walk. Uh, make uh, no mistake, though, and I need to add this, that as long as, as our men and women continue to serve in Afghanistan until the last one goes, it'll remain my highest priority and our department's highest priority as it has been all the time 
I've been here to provide them with all the support we can possibly give them. Uh, through the hard work and sacrifices made by American coalition and service members, the Afghan security forces have stood up. This summer, they took the fight to the enemy, and in so doing, and I've been watching this for a long time, sent the Taliban the unmistakable message that the ANSF are here to stay. And because our Afghan partners have been in the lead, they have taken larger casualties, and U.S. and coalition casualties have mercifully declined to the lowest levels they've been all my time. But U.S. service members still serve in danger, and though thankfully in much lower numbers, American servicemen and women continue to be killed and wounded. I'm personally reminded of this somber fact when I greet families at Dover Air Force Base, families of the fallen, and when my wife and I visit the hospitals. So even as we draw down, our troops in the field continue to need our very best. Protection from IEDs, the best ISR, the best logistics support, everything we can do for them. And as the war winds down, we must ensure that those who have borne the brunt of battle continue to receive the best medical care. Their families, particularly those who have sacrificed everything, deserve all that we can provide. While combat operations are ending for tens of thousands, tens of thousands, including some who may have been your classmates just a few years ago, the effects of war will endure. And for them, the real tests are only beginning. Now, even as we remain laser focused on the essential tasks at hand and our folks in danger as we speak. We must of necessity, must of necessity turn a great strategic corner from the era of Iraq and Afghanistan to the challenges and opportunities that are going to define this country's future. And because of the role we play in the world, much of the world's future. As we make this transition, we need to be mindful of the drivers that are going to shape this landscape. Chief among them are the world's shifting geopolitical centers of gravity, as countries such as China, and India, and Brazil, and Indonesia reshape the global economy, and regional powers like Turkey assert greater influence. At the same time, the quickening pace of technological change has increasingly flattened the world connecting all of us in ways that can increase common understanding and drive social change, but can also be misappropriated by rogue states, violent extremists, and sophisticated criminal syndicates to wreak havoc on society. Climate change promises to reshape the map in places like the Arctic while at the same time making it increasingly likely that we'll experience natural disasters like Katrina, Sandy, and the recent Philippine typhoon on a, more on a more frequent basis. Demographic change will mean aging populations in the United States and Europe, and even more so in China and Russia. And this will strain their social safety nets. And at the same time, the so-called youth bulge in much of the developing world will challenge governments and economies to keep pace with young people's demands for education, for jobs, for a voice in how they're governed. And finally, changes in energy demand and production will continue to have extensive geopolitical ramifications. Advances in oil and gas ex extraction hold the potential for the United States to achieve much lower dependence on foreign imports. Meanwhile, increased energy requirements, particularly in China and other countries in Asia, hold the potential to new, spark new competition for those very same resources. Cognizant of these trends, we already know what many of the future challenges will be before us. Continued turmoil in the Middle East, the persistent threat of terrorism, which will be with us as long as there is society, because there will always be the problem of the few against the many, the aberrant who are out to upset life for everyone else. 
whatever their cause, whether it's an ideological cause or they're just crazy, always be the problem of the few against the many. And enduring threats like weapons of mass destruction, which can't be uninvented, and threats in new domains like space and cyber, all that lies before you. But at the same time, there are really great opportunities as well. Among them, important for this audience of maritime uh, warriors, is to shift the great intellectual and physical weight of our wonderful Department of Defense that has been devoted so heavily to Iraq and Afghanistan in the past decade to the Asia Pacific region, where America can and must continue to play its pivotal, stabilizing role into the future. To develop innovative new capabilities from a vibrant defense technology effort, as we've done for decades, starting long ago with technologies like stealth, GPS, and the internet itself. To capitalize on all these lessons we've learned at great difficulty during the war, over the last decade, about how to use our forces innovatively, like networking and near real-time fusion of intelligence and operations, to manage our presence in new ways and in new regions, from the Asia Pacific to Africa, the Middle East, and Europe, to leverage the reserve and guard components of our force that have performed so superbly over the last decade, and to build the capacity of partners and allies so that they can shoulder more of the burden that America now shoulders. And as we make these, this great strategic transition upon which we have to be embarked right now, we'll need to contend with another significant change in the status quo. And that's the need to absorb reductions in defense spending in the interest of the nation's overall fiscal health. And let me say something about that just for a moment, so much in the newspapers. Uh, first of all, it is very important, but it's not as consequential as the strategic change we have to make. That's the most important thing, more important than money. Now, there's a right way and a wrong way to go about budgetary change. All too often recently, we have felt the effects of trying to bring about change the wrong way. Government shutdown, sequestration, lack of budget for this fiscal year still have each taken a significant toll on our people and on our operations. Sequestration has already meant that fighter squadrons have been grounded, soldiers and Marines have been forced to forego unit-level training, Ships haven't gotten underway, and maintenance on our weapon systems has been delayed. And what's tragic in all this is that this risk to national security and to the force is not a result of an economic emergency or a recession. It's not because defense cuts are the answer to the nation's overall fiscal challenges. Do the math. It's not in reaction to a revolutionary breakthrough in military technology that somehow makes everything else not necessary anymore. It's certainly not the result of a sudden transformation to a more peaceful world. Sequester is purely an artificial, self-inflicted wound. It's disgraceful, it's embarrassing, it's unnecessary. And by the way, sequestration and government shutdown have meant that our civilian workers, many of whom themselves are military veterans, have multiple times this year been told to stay home from work. And this is no way to treat patriots. I know the Naval Academy itself hasn't been immune to these impacts and that many of you had classes canceled because your civilian instructors were among those furloughed. And what goes for the Department of Defense's civilian workforce also goes for our diplomats, our development experts, for the Department of Energy physicists working to ensure the viability of our nuclear deterrent, for teachers working to educate the next generation, and so forth. The bottom line is that we need a government that functions in order to be a strong nation. 
and the cumulative effect of sequestration and our lack of an operating budget mean that the department's leaders, we, Secretary Hagel, myself, and the rest of us, must plan for the future under a cloud of uncertainty. And just as it would be irresponsible to pilot a ship without appropriate maps and weather data, it's irresponsible to pilot the Department of Defense without knowing the basics of our budget. Uncertainty makes it very difficult for us to effectively plan and implement a national defense strategy. It limits our flexibility and it forces us to make decisions that are neither strategically nor managerially sound. So, we're hoping that Congress acts quickly to remove this cloud of uncertainty and provides the department with the time and the flexibility to implement spending reductions more strategically. In the meantime, in the meantime, we're doing everything we can to cut costs the right way. In terms of our responsibility to the American taxpayer, we need, need to make sure every dollar counts. This means making important changes to control costs in our acquisition system, our contracting, things I've worked hard on over the last five years or what we could do better. It means reducing our overhead and focusing ourselves on internal reform and on reducing tail so we can have more tooth. In line with Secretary Hagel's decision this summer that the department would implement a 20% reduction in headquarters budgets, just shoom, starting with his own office, the Office of the Secretary of Defense, to make an example of it, cut it more deeply than anything else. It means reigning in the increasing costs of military health care. And it means making tough choices in terms of our personnel numbers and compensation policy. And this, this is a difficult issue. But the bottom line is this. Health care and compensation consume roughly half of the Department of Defense's budget. And this percentage, if left unchecked, is going to increase. And this will crowd out everything else, from the money required to research new ship designs to the funds necessary to sail and repair the ships we already have. Secretary Hagel, General Dempsey, Admiral Winnefeld, Admiral Greener, General Amos, and the department's other senior leaders' top priority is to ensure that our military continues to attract and retain quality people like you and the men and women you'll lead who make up the all-volunteer force. That means providing you with the compensation you deserve. But it also means ensuring that the department also has the funds needed to have enough of you and to train you and to equip you. That requires balance. To send excellent people into battle in too few numbers or with less training or less modern equipment than they need to succeed and be safe would also be unconscionable. And I'll add that to recruit and retain and to represent, as you will do, the all-volunteer force, we must maintain an environment of mutual respect and trust. And this means, among other things, many other things, an environment in which sexual assault simply isn't tolerated. Each of us is responsible for establishing a culture and a climate that prevents sexual assault for, before it occurs, that holds perpetrators appropriately accountable, and that instills confidence in victims that it's okay to come forward. That's the essence of what honor, courage, and commitment are all about. Each of you, as leaders, must live this credo every day. <coughs> Now, I'm confident that you will make the right personal and professional choices, and I'm also confident that our country will make the right budget choices, <laughs> and, I'm, and that the department will make, and will be allowed by Congress to make, the right managerial choices. But you'll enter active duty at a strategic crossroads, and here you and your generation will need to make the right strategic choices. You're entering service at a time in which our elected leaders and ultimately the American people that they represent have to decide America's role in the world and the type of military we want. 
Some want to reduce that role. My hope is that we will choose a path of responsibility and leadership, one that manages the downturn in defense spending responsibly and wisely, but above all, above all, rises to the challenge of history, as America's always done, because history also records the consequences of disengagement and reduced readiness. It's not a path we can afford to choose. And that leads us to some strategic tasks which we, we and I, watching you, will be counting on you to carry out. First, now more than ever, maintaining a technological edge over our competitors is the surest way to deter conflict. And therefore, we have to continue to invest in those technologies that will be essential to 21st century defense. And there's some people who say, well, the budget's getting cut, so everybody needs to take a cut. Baloney. Not everybody needs to take a cut. Things that are more valuable to our strategic future shouldn't be cut. They should be increased. And things that are less so should be cut more than the rest of the budget. And that's why President Obama and Secretary Hagel and I have insisted that we go out of our way to protect critical investments, even in this time of budget austerity. In a sense, it's more important to be innovative now than ever, because we can't spend our way out of problems. We have to think our way out of problems. So we're increasing our investments in, for example, cyber, in recognition of the growing threat that cyber poses to our security and our critical infrastructure. In the space domain, we're rebalancing our portfolio to improve our capabilities to defend against threats in space, degrade enemy capabilities, and operate in a contested environment. We're requesting funds for additional submarines and new ships to sustain our dominance on the sea. And we're also making important investments in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets, unmanned and manned including platforms that launch from both land and sea and can operate both well above the Earth's surface and deep into the ocean's depths. And we're doing things I can't name, but you'll come to know in time and that will surprise our potential foes. Second, in tandem with our civilian counterparts from across the U.S. government, we have to fully implement the President's strategy to rebalance resources and attention to the Asia-Pacific region. This a particular job for you and our maritime forces. Asia is home to 60 percent of the world's population, and the countries that border the Pacific count for well over the global, half of the global economy. The logic of our rebalance is simple. The Asia-Pacific theater has enjoyed peace and prosperity for 60 years. This despite the fact that there was no NATO in Asia, the wounds of World War II never healed, we all hate each other, uh, to, make, to make sure that the peace was kept. During those 60 years, First, despite that, during those 60 years, first Japan rose and prospered, then South Korea rose and prospered, then the countries of Southeast Asia rose and prospered, and today, now, yes, China and India rise and prosper. And that's fine, that's good for us. But none of this was a foregone conclusion when you consider where the Asia Pacific region was at, at the end of World War II. And that miracle was enabled by the United States and by two things we did. The first is by standing for enduring principles in that region that they like, but that attracts them to us. They include a commitment to free and open commerce, a just international order that emphasizes rights and responsibilities of nations and fidelity to the rule of law, open access by all to the shared domains of sea, air, space, and now cyberspace, and the principle of resolving conflict without the, US, without the use of force. That's what we stand for. 
in that region. People like that. And second, and very importantly for us, the Asian miracle was also enabled by the pivotal role of U.S. military power and presence in the region. Presence a long line of Annapolis grads have provided over the years. Your strong security presence in the Asia Pacific has provided a critical foundation for the principles we believe in to take root. The United States, in a nutshell, continue, intends to continue to play that role into the future of the digital power in the Asia Pacific theater. Third task facing us in the department is continuing to build upon the web of international alliances that have underwritten global security since World War II and starting some new partnerships. Working with allies and partners takes constant attention and hard work. As with any relationship, sometimes differences of opinion emerge and those differences have to be worked through. But remember this, remember this, the United States is the security partner of choice for the vast majority of nations around the world. This is a state of affairs our adversaries and competitors don't enjoy. Nobody likes them. And that gives us and our partners a tremendous advantage and one worthy of our continued investment. Maintaining this advantage means continuing to invest in our Asian alliances, NATO allies. Uh, it means breaking down the bureaucratic barriers that sometimes stop us from creating new partnerships. For example, with India, something I've worked a lot on, India is destined to be a partner of ours, a democratic, largely English-speaking uh, country of a billion people, destined to be a friend of ours. And we need to get out of our own way and make that possible. And it means growing our participation and support for new multilateral fora, like the ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which increased trust and transparency in the entire region. And it demands that each and every one of you take personal ownership for strengthening our partnership, partnerships by being uniformed ambassadors of this great country everywhere you go. And fourth and last, even as we write to focus on and invest in the future, we must take care not to lose the lessons we learned so painfully during the last decade of war. These include the tremendous competencies developed and honed by Special Operations Forces, as well as the capabilities brought to bear by innovations, ISR, the fusion of intelligence and operations that I spoke of earlier. But we also have to, and this is important, make permanent what we've learned about quickly responding to urgent warfighter needs. For example, our rapid fielding of MRAP vehicles and other counter IED capabilities. Why do I say this? I say it because one thing we can be certain of is that our adversaries are always adapting. And so we in the United States have to be more agile than they are, so we get there first all the time. And uh, that's not automatic in our system. Uh, our system grew up in the Cold War where things moved slowly. And tradition is a great strength in our military, but so also is the capability to change. And we showed such, you showed such an amazing capability to change in the last decade. Who the hell ever thought we'd be doing what we ended up doing in Iraq and Afghanistan? Your classes that preceded those wars weren't studied in those wars, and yet our military adapted and did it. And that means being bold about questioning the way we do things, not just doing them the way they've always been done, and making sure that we keep up with our foes and with changing technology. And this is going to require constant personal attention for you. Because the system wants to do what the system has always done. And it's leaders who spur change. And that focus on agility for us, so learned so hard in Iraq and Afghanistan, has already played dividends. We've begun to take the processes we devised for Iraq and Afghanistan and apply them not to the wars that are ongoing, but to the wars that might be, such as with Iran. 
uh, where we're rapidly fielding capabilities, for example, and you may all be familiar with this, dealing with speedboats uh, in the hands of the Iranians as a threat to our naval assets in the Persian Gulf. Uh, we've developed and made prototypes for improvements to a penetrating bomb that would allow us to target hardened and deeply buried facilities. And last year, as it happens, we decided to field a, uh, rapidly a uh, deployable hydrolysis system, a transportable system that can destroy chemical weapons stockpiles wherever they're found, and just so happens that in the last year, a possible use for that arose. So as future frontline leaders, you in this room will soon be responsible for carrying out each of these key strategic tasks. You are going to do it. Now, I, as much as I like to think that my own career has just begun, uh, I have picked up a few lessons along the way. So let me give you a few words of advice in closing as you set out to do this. Perhaps the greatest lesson that I've learned is that you can't know where your life, professional or otherwise, is going to lead. When I was about your age, I thought my future was as a theoretical physicist working on equations for quantum chromodynamics, which is a theory that was of the subatomic sub, uh, uh, particles and reactions. And I'm reflecting on how I came to this point to be your Deputy Secretary of Defense, I made a couple of observations I want to share with you. The first is tr to trust and to hone what you uniquely contribute, what you're really good at. And I say that uh, because when I started out, my strength was technology. I understood how everything worked. And I soon realized when I got into public affairs that that meant that I may not have known everything everybody else did, I may not have had their experience, but I knew one thing, and I could contribute that. And that gave me the confidence and the sense of contribution. And it was my way of getting into this field. For others, it might be knowledge of history, it might be language skills, superior writing, uh, but whatever you have, whatever you're really good at, that's your angle of attack on this problem. And what I did was I was asked to take one year, this is like 40 years ago, <laughs> take one year off of physics and work on a problem that was at that, uh, a very um, important one at the time, which was what to do with the MX missile and what to do about Star Wars. And I didn't know much about Washington or national security or the world at all, but I knew something about physics. And that, then I felt that I could make a contribution to this thing that was bigger than myself. Follow your nose when you get that feeling. And the second thing is don't try to plan your career out step by step and choose the next step by trying to figure out whether it'll lead, where it'll lead. I ne I've never done that. Uh, I gave up on trying to figure it all out and plot it all ahead. And I came to a different principle, which I commend to you, which is think about your, as, as you think about your next move, ask yourself, what am I going to like? What am I going to be good at? Because if you like what you're doing and you're good at it, it'll lead somewhere. Whereas if you only did it to get ahead and to get to the next step, you're not going to do it as well. It's not going to lead anywhere. So don't be afraid to go where it, you feel like you're making your best contribution. Uh, I grew up in a security world, the Cold War, in which the security challenges were much less variegated than the ones you face. Uh, what you have instead is the opportunity to serve this country at a time in which the pace of change has never been greater. An incredibly complicated and fascinating time. I envy you. But it's also a time in which more now than ever, despite political gridlock, budget uncertainty, and all that, the United States remains the world's preeminent economic, diplomatic, and military power. Yeah. Secretary Hagel said, no other nation has the will, the power, the capacity, the capability, and the network of alliances to lead the international community in addressing the challenges of the 21st century. Those are wise words. 
five years of working with the Department of Defense and senior leadership and interacting with service members around the world have convinced me that the United States will maintain the strengths that have allowed us to assume the mantle of leadership. But the security and prosperity that you represent is not a birthright. And there are a lot of Americans that you'll find won't understand that. They won't remember that. It's a paradox of what we do. The more safe people feel, the better you do your job, the more they'll take you for granted. I always say security is like oxygen. If you have it, you don't pay any attention to it. But if you don't have it, it's all you can think of. If you're doing your job, you'll sometimes feel that your fellow citizens take you for granted. Now, relatively young ages, each of you began your professional lives in public service. You entered this academy ready to serve a nation at war. Some of you already served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Others have watched families and friends serve. Public service is a great calling, and I, for one, hope you stick with it for the remainder of your careers. <laughs> this may mean lots of different kind of careers for you, but one in which your contribution to things that are bigger than yourselves uh, is the central purpose. Keep this in mind as you embark on your careers. One legacy of the U.S. Naval Academy is reflected in the caliber of the graduates with whom I've had privilege to work over my career. People like Senator John McCain, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Mike Mullen, Chief of Naval Operations John Greener, Vice Chief of Naval Operations Mark Ferguson, former ISAF Commander General John Allen, our current Commander Joe Dunford, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations Vice Admiral Michelle Howard, just to name a few. But graduating future senators, chairmen, and CNOs isn't this institution's sole legacy, or even its main legacy. That honor resides with the Academy's role in producing leaders of all stripes who share in a common period of service in one capacity as combat leaders, followed by a lifetime of service in other capacities. You've chosen an exceptional time to become ensigns and second lieutenants in the greatest maritime force the world has ever known. Everything I've described today depends on you, full stop. I've never seen greater demands placed on the shoulders of junior officers. Those demands will continue to require your full measure of moral, mental, and physical courage. Yet the very fact that you're sitting here today tells me that the easy path isn't what motivates you in the first place. The challenges of tomorrow will require all of your talent and determination. I'm confident that you're up to the task. That's what our sailors and Marines have the right to demand. And I'll close as President Kennedy opened on this very campus 52 years ago. He said, I am proud as a citizen of the United States to come to this institution and this room where there is concentrated so many who have committed themselves to the defense of the United States. And I, too, am incredibly proud, as your Deputy Secretary and a citizen, to be at this institution with you today. Live your lives and conduct yourselves in a manner that keeps faith with the sacrifices of those who's gone before you from warden field to the battlefield. Live your lives to, to deserve the greatest privilege that can be bestowed on an American, a commission as an officer and the United States military. It's been an honor and a privilege to serve as your Deputy Secretary. Many thanks to each and every one of you for being here, to your families, and what you'll do for us in the future. And while as Deputy Secretary, I can't technically pick sides in the Army-Navy game, as a soon-to-be former Deputy Secretary of Defense, go Navy, beat Army. Well, I'm in your hands. I've got time for some questions if you all do. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, first, sir, I'm in. Uh, going back 
to the uh, financial uh, or finances of the Department of Defense, last night I read, a, read an article about the, uh, how the Department of Defense is looking to cut the U.S. commissaries. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, sure. Uh, the question was about commissaries and looking to cut commissary support, and that's true. We are looking at that. Uh, it's not because we're out to get commissary. We're looking at everything. Uh, we just have to today. We have to be rigorous, and, and you know, uh, uh, everything has to be uh, looked at, and we have to ask ourselves, can we uh, attain savings? And is in continued investment in commissaries, which costs our department several billion dollars a year, the best use of several billion dollars? And it's that kind of hard choose choice we do all the time. So do you want that, or do you want more sailors, or do you want new ships? or new command and control, it's that comes down to that all the time. So we're looking at everything. We haven't made any decisions about that yet. Um, but uh, we are looking at that. And of course, this is very painful stuff because we don't want to do any of this. Uh, but we have to make those choices. Yeah. Sir, Sir First Clark Emerson, uh, Coal Company. Uh, my question is, uh, for in, even in Afghanistan, there's a number, number of factors such as um, their willingness to uh, interact with the Pakistani Taliban, the uh, corruption within the democracy where you have to buy loyalty, um, Karzai's unwillingness to accept any uh, deal right now for us to yep. maintain troops. Yep. Um, does the U.S. really expect a democracy to stay in Afghanistan? And if we begin to see a transition away from democracy after we leave, either you leave with just a small force that we're going to leave or leave completely in you know, a few years down the road, do we have the tendencies to stop that transition or would it allowed to happen these are, these are fantastic questions, and I don't have the complete answer to that, but I'll tell you how I look at it. And I've been doing this, I've been looking at this place now for a while. And let me start, uh, kind of back into which is the question was, you know, what about Afghanistan? Are we really going to, is this place going to turn out okay or not? Uh, and from a, let me start from a military point of view, and our, I, I never thought we'd be where we are. It is spectacular. Not just the job we did, but the, where the ANSF is. So one way to answer your question is that the ANSF can keep the lid on uh, and maintain security in Afghanistan if the right conditions are maintained. Now, first of all, one of those is we get a BSA. That depends on President Karzai. I'm not going to say what I think about that. Uh, uh, the second, but I think we're probably going to get it in the end, but I, I'm just uh, getting, how to say this, impatient. Uh, the, uh, the second is that they go forward with the elections and the transition to democracy and so forth. The third is that we tamp down, you mentioned corruption, corruption's a big problem. And we're not going to eradicate corruption there or anywhere else, but it got out of hand for a few years. And uh, we've got to uh, uh, continue to combat that. Um, and uh, some of that is associated with um, uh, the current generation of leadership there. Uh, I think that may, imp it may improve uh, as well. Uh, so I, on balance, I'm not rosy glasses. Uh, but on balance, I think that we can get a successful result uh, out of this. Uh, and damn it, damn it, we deserve it because uh, we've given a great deal for this result. And for now, a s relatively small marginal investment into the future, we can secure that result. Uh, so that's the path that we want to be on. Uh, we need the BSA to do it, and we need lots of other ingredients. You mentioned Pakistan and so forth. So our performance is necessary, but far from sufficient. Um, but on the whole, uh, I, I, I bet on the positive side in Afghanistan. And I'm not just saying that because I've been involved in it for five years and I got brainwashed myself or something. I try to stand back and be analytical. That's really the way I see it. Yeah. Okay. Um, sir, First Class Madrid, uh, given your experience and background in acquisitions, um, you mentioned the importance of rapid prototyping and getting solutions out to the war fighter. So do you see 
the need for a complete reform of the acquisition program or more for fostering of new set of programs for the rapid set of questions? Question, question was, is when I talked about rapid acquisition, uh, uh, I, am I just talking about that or am I talking about a wholesale change in the acquisition system? And the answer to that is both. Uh, we need the fast lane. I call it the fast lane. Uh, where you don't, you don't wait until you've figured out everything in order to get started. You can't act like that in today's world. You've got to take risk and uh, just like you do during the war. We've, we've done all kinds of stuff in the war. Some of it didn't even work out. But we've done it because we're at war, and damn it, we need to give people the best, our best effort. So we take risk, uh, and we try to do things quickly. We've got to be able to do that, or as I said, we're not going to be the best military in the world. But a lot of the things we do, particularly the futuristic things we do, necessarily take years. And my beef about them, as I was Undersecretary for Acquisition Technology and Logistics, was they cost too damn much. We were paying way too much for everything. Uh, and why is that? It was because for 10 years we had a lot of dough. <coughs> and so most of our managers had come over that period of time when they got themselves in trouble in a problem of some kind in their, their program to reach for more money. There was always more money. And they'd forgotten how to solve problems in other ways than with more money. So we were pay paying too much for everything. And, and uh, so we uh, began a process and you're, you're, that I think we're, is still in, I'm never satisfied. We gotta keep at it. We owe the taxpayer and the warfighter the best return on every dollar. And we've got to continue to do better. But we are doing a lot better than we were a few years ago. And, and the, 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 the essence of it, and this isn't rocket science, a lot of this is what you do at a restaurant. At a restaurant, you know, you get the bill and then you kind of look at it and say, hey, geez, I didn't know I was paying eight bucks for a broccoli side dish. And, and they charged me for the second glass of iced tea. I mean, you look at the, your costs and say, why is it that way? Why am I paying that? And so we had stopped looking at the bill. And so when it comes to things like the Joint Strike Fighter, which is our largest program and a very important program, we needed to go down and look at the costs and say, why am I paying that? Why are five people doing that and not four people doing that? Why is it taking three steps or three years and not two steps in two years uh, to do that? Because, you know, if there's money around, people will hire people and never let anybody go, uh, say yes to every new doodad that somebody wants to put on the airplane, and there's nobody going, hey, wait a minute, time out. We can't afford this. So we had to reinstill cost control and a lot of things. In other words, the presidential helicopter, by the way, anybody familiar with that? Which I used to say, we had become the White House with a rotor on it. I mean, we had just hogged everything into that helicopter uh, to the point where it was uh, way too expensive. And we can't do everything that way because, um, you know, the, 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 the more smarter we are with every dollar, the more stuff we can have, the more training we can have, the more people we can have. So we got to do better. So I'm not, I'm not satisfied. We're doing a lot better than we could. So we have to do the fast lane and we have to continue to reform the way we do business. Is that it? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.